Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Long have you waited for uh, my semifinals prediction and uh, assessment. And um, I've thought about it a lot and I took my time to really ponder about it. Uh, looking down, uh, you know, at the history of both of these teams uh, since the last time they faced off against each other. G2 had a very easy time because G2 is the type of team that really adapts well to teams that uh, play revolving the same pattern over and over again. We look at their words run that year. What G2 did so good against um, Damwon was that they found a way to break their playstyle. Damwon's playstyle was greedy clip to top, mid lane, play in isolation, and then Canyon does his best to make sure that the bot lane is not a liability. And then Nuguri and Showmaker found ways of getting advantages through Klepto or just through solo killing and just CS advantages. What G2 did as a plan, which was very evident, was to make sure that the mid lane matchup in isolation can push 1v1. And also, the preparation that they are the ones to blind pick the Jace was very neat too, because Jace was good into Vladimir and Kale, and you denied the Jace of Nuguri. So this is what G2 did so well that year. They could adapt to anyone. They also had very, very good mid to late game decision making. And Damwon, being as predictable as they were, G2 was their kryptonite. Looking further, G2 went on to face, of course, FPX. And the biggest weakness there for G2 was that they had uh, preparation mistakes. They still had that crisp uh, mid to late game decision making, I feel. Probably they could have taken the Varos game that they played. Uh, but the issue was the 2v2 mid lane was not as strong as FPX's. And there's no shame in that, of course. No shame at all. They could brute force wins when they had Kaiser and, uh, and Zaya. But when they didn't have those champions, it required additional steps in the early game that FPX had put in a lot of effort and time into figuring out. And that leads me into what we have today. You know, coming into tomorrow. Damwon. This is a meta that they've been playing for quite some time. I think looking at the LEC as a whole and G2, uh, Europe was rather slow in keeping up. When Nidli was a big part of the meta set, I think they were very quick to adapt to Lucian. That was locked in almost right away, right? By Fnatic. We all remember that. Um, farming jungle wasn't such a big deal over in Europe. Fnatic tried to pull it off, but um, during the regular season, Fnatic was very weak. Very, very weak. In fact, terrible by their standards. They were saved by 10.16. Evelyn became strong, Hecarim got buffed, and uh, everything the, the Fnatic were trying to do made more sense. The reason I'm bringing this up is I think this is Damwon's biggest strength coming into this matchup. The fact that they've been playing this style for a very, very long time. I think in terms of fitting in the mold that we see as the meta, I think Damwon places there super, super well. The same way FPX placed super, super well in the previous meta that they won the World Championship in. Very, very hard on the 2v2 mid, fake pressuring, fake pressuring, getting mid prior, diving, getting mid prior, diving. They were very, very good and precise when it comes to this play style. This, of course, is still relevant today. I think all four top teams really, really put a lot of effort into thinking about this. Usually, after a team wins a championship, the qualities that they have become the norm. In the sense that any team that has aspirations of winning a world championship is going to take that information and try to make it their own. Same thing happened after MSI. 
G2 brought something to the table that was so unique. They were so free flowing. They were like water. You know, they had the pike top. They had the different picks and the adaptability within the game really put them a large, large, large level ahead of everybody else. If you take a look at that best of five between them and SKT, some of the decisions they were making really, really, you know, they were running laps around SKT's head. And SKT didn't play bad. SKT was good. They were looking good during this MSI. But D2, of course, won. After that was achieved, it was an eye-opener for everybody. Same thing as last year, 2018, when everyone started playing AP mid lanes. Teams look at winners and begin to chase them, right? Same thing after 2019. The emphasis on the 2v2 mid was very, very clear uh, for G2. This is something that they put a lot of effort into figuring out throughout the year. They had this one-year plan in order to make sure that they are prepared for the World Championship. And I think from an outside perspective, you can see that it's uh, working as well as it possibly could. G2 are ramping up exactly at the right time, and I'm hoping they don't feel tired. You know, the big question coming into, uh, of course, the Genji match was how much can they improve over the span of a week? And uh, when you have that much experience, being the most experienced roster out of all the teams that are left, one week can mean so much. Because some of the issues that you need to solve, you've been there before. I can recognize this as, as well when I begin to work with sometimes the same team. Some of the issues that you need to solve are issues that you've solved in the past. Those pathways are already done and made. If Yankos and Perks are on the performing group stage, these are the type of players that uh, you easily, easily put faith in in terms of correcting uh, those mistakes and learning from these mistakes. And also G2 as a team as a whole. Because from outside, we've always, you know, everyone has envied the environment that G2 has. That's how it seems from the outside, at least. This is a team where all players are on the same page and they can solve issues very, very well. So even in this week's practice coming into the Dama matchup, that is something that can be very intriguing. I feel like Dama one, what we've seen is what we can expect. I think both of these teams, even though they 3 0 it wasn't the cleanest 3 0s You know, there was some back and forth, but uh, you, could, you could feel in the games that it was never out of hand except maybe game one um versus genji for g2 but all in all it was clear who the favorite was we saw some slip ups here and there that one with some imprecisions uh canyon being the big difference maker uh just completely annihilating bioshik and um showmaker uh also performing just as well as chovi so there was nothing really that drx had to over uh, offer same thing for Genji, uh, Caps uh, played out of his mind, he got a small advantage and he took it and ran away with the game. But in terms of improvements, I have higher expectations of G2's improvements in the span of a week. When they get to prepare against one specific enemy, it helps a lot. It definitely helps a lot. But the reason I made the whole story about Damwon and how you could prepare against their playstyle last year... I don't think that's the case this year. There's a line where a playstyle, you know, if you can define a team's playstyle, most of the time that's a weakness of theirs. There's a point you reach where teams just play good League of Legends and no longer can be defined as a playstyle. And this is how I view Damwon currently. I think Damwon is um, the most consistent team uh, out of all of the teams that are left in the tournament. But in a world where there's a lot of variance, uh, consistency isn't, you know, the thing that conquers all. When I speak of variance, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is um, the mental aspect. 
So that one has been Scrim Gods for a very long time. And um, LCK being without a crowd could, keep in mind, I say could, could have an impact on players. And Damwon, historically, could be one of those teams that could potentially be affected by something like this. The scrim performance has always been rumored as one of the best. And I saw it too, when I was over in the LCK, of course. Even though I th- I felt like now, practicing against them in the past was different from practicing against them this year. I felt like they were more loose and they were more G2-esque in uh, their practice, but maybe that was just specifically against us in uh, the middle of uh, the season. We had about three, four blocks with them, uh, meaning like 24 games. So it is not something that, you know, defines their whole thought process behind their practice. But the reason I'm saying this is the stakes are rising. We've seen time and time again how Damwon have um, built up for this moment. That could be negative, right? Pressure can be negative or pressure can be good, right? But in terms of really knowing for sure who delivers under pressure, I feel like that's G2. In terms of mental, I think is natural, even though it's intangible, right? It's not something that I can measure. I'm inclined to lean uh, to G2 having a major advantage in this, you know? G2 are very experienced, very experienced. They've been in all types of situations. Any situation you can think of, they've been in. And in most cases, they conquer those situations. And that is going to matter. That is definitely going to matter. So point G2. I wanted to go down lane for lane. You know, I know this is kind of all over the place. I'm just kind of giving you guys my thoughts. The matchup uh, that I want to start with was just uh, Nuguri versus Wunder. So Nuguri has performed super, super well. And I don't think this is the same Nuguri we we dealt with last year. This is not a kleptomaniac that uh, just plays Klepto all the time and uh, plays very greedy. Uh, this is no longer the case. Uh, Nuguri is a very well-rounded player. So is Wunda. I feel like if there's any weakness to Nuguri, is um, in some cases he takes bigger risks than necessary. But I think this is something that you can uh, put on some of the other top laners that are in top four. I think the same thing can be said for 369. The same thing can be said for uh, Ben as well. And honestly, the same thing can be said for Wunder too. But I feel like in this World Championship, Wunder has been very, very consistent. Surprisingly consistent. I feel like the nature of the role top lane requires you to take some risks that are going to be, you know... Better to take than the upcoming position you will be in. Basically, you take a risk in the moment of time that you're in, meaning you take a trade, uh, you gamble. That risk is going to be better to take than what is going to come after. If the enemy freezes or the enemy jungler is not there and he's just farming. And, you know, the nature of the top lane role is very, very volatile. In terms of being well-rounded and well-prepared, when I think of Nuguri, I think both Wunder and Nuguri play very good Camille. I would say Nuguri is a better Renekton. I would say uh, Volibear is on even grounds. Like, Wunder is also a good Renekton. But this is something that Nuguri has played over and over again, you know? I think 2v2 begins to matter on how you maneuver yourself around 2v2. And I think this is where Nuguri and Kanye will have an edge in the 2v2 top. I think in terms of 2v2 top, Damwon is very, very dangerous. If I'm Damwon, the approach I would have, because the edge Wunder has, in my opinion, is I think he's much more suited to deal with an orn oriented meta. What I mean by that is European teams prepared, for example, Shen. We know that uh, Wunder plays a good Silas. Nuguri does too. He plays Kale. He plays a lot of champions that are good against Orn. Plays also, at the same time, a very good Orn. But if Orn is out of the picture, 
how does it change the meta? All of a sudden, Camille, Renekton become the priority picks. Unless, of course, you want to blind pick Kennen, which is another thing that is good for Nuguri. So that's something that I would pay attention to. I think if Orn is in the picture, I think the champions that uh, Wunder wants to play is better. But I think if Orn is banned, I think Nuguri does better. Because these champions are more evolved around the 2v2 when it comes to his synergy with Canyon. I think that's better. So I give a slight advantage in two different situations for the individual matchup in top. Which moves us to jungle. Canyon. I think it goes without saying. He's performed better. Uh, he has, he's in the conversation for the best jungler of this tournament. I think uh, the only other person that... Uh, Belongs in this conversation is SOFM. Canyon has been extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. It is weird because I think he's almost been too good. Because it's at the point where he's so precise in his decision making that it has put Daman in the position where they don't need to do much more. It seems playing with Canyon is such a freedom because it is very, very hard to find any mistakes that Canyon is doing. Sure, I'm, uh, if I check the pro views, I'm sure I can find something. But you get what I'm getting at, you know? Canyon has been unbelievably precise. It's also, you know, people want to talk about, oh, this is the perfect method of Canyon, but when Canyon played set, when he played the Volibears, when he played the Leeson, he was just as good. He has had an incredible year. And um, especially summer. I think spring, uh, honestly, I don't remember spring. So just forget. I, I just said summer. Summer and Worlds. He's had an amazing summer and Worlds. I don't remember spring. The reason I bring this up is because at Worlds, Canyon has primarily played one champion. And that is Graves. Graves is left open super, super much. He gets to play Graves. He 1v9s the game most of the time. I believe he lost one Graves game. That was with set top and Galio mid. This was against JDG, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So the question is, what happens when you begin to remove Graves? Because that's fair. The Rx tried to pick Graves. The enemy, uh, Canyon, meaning, uh, yeah, the enemy it was Damon in this case. Uh, they just picked Kindred. So this is something that he has in his back pocket too. I wouldn't worry about Canyon's champion pool because as I mentioned, he's been very, very good in different matters across the summer split. But jungle champions tie into the champions that your other lanes want to play. So Nidalee, of course, Canyon can play. We just mentioned the whole Noguri business with his Renekton and Camille. No problem. Graves is important because of Showmaker, I feel. The best example I can do in terms of jungle pool tying to your teammates is self-made. I'm sure he can play Nidalee, 100% sure. Mechanically, he is very talented. No way in hell he doesn't play Nidalee. But your teammates need to play the right champions. What's the point of playing Nidalee if you can't play set mid? For an Ecton, Camille top is not what you want to play. This is not something we associate right away with Bipo, right? And these are some of the questions that you need to ask yourself. What happens? Maybe the Graves gets removed, and maybe the jungle pool changes a little bit. Maybe Orn is in band. All of a sudden, Graves is removed. How does this shift the nature of the game for Dama? Because many of the games they played at the World Championship have been revolving around Graves. So this is the only caveat, the only question mark that I had there. But it's not necessarily tied to Canyon. It's more tied to Daman as a whole. Yankos has shown improvement. Plays Nidalee, Lilia. It's also, you know, I say Yankos has shown improvement. It's just G2 has shown improvement. They play more with patience. You know, It's no longer, oh, I, I did a trade that's bad top. Come fix it for me. I don't care about your jungle camps. It's more about, you know, it's more about Yankos. He has a spotlight on him, you know, within the team. Their G2 as a team has developed in the way they play for their jungler. 
And I like as well that um, they've removed that role from Caps. I think that's very important. They were trying to do it in Group Sage where Caps has that role, where Caps is the one pushing Yankos up. But I think in reality, it should have been the side laners. Caps is a massive strength. And um, Caps was sacrificing a lot of lane states and lane advantages just for the purpose of checking camps for Yankos, giving information for Yankos. And um, in a lot of cases, it makes sense. But I think in G2's case, it doesn't, doesn't because of the intelligence Caps has in terms of just winning games. I would say Advantage Canyon. I don't think a lot of people would say anything else. Which moves us to mid lane. Showmaker, you know, I think Showmaker is is really, you know, the best way of describing how you know as a he the showmaker as a player is the best way of describing Damon as a team. Very, very solid and um very, very infrequently does more than is necessary. The reason Damon is very precise is because they have no urge to want to stomp you or to drive you out of the game completely. No urge at all. They recognize the boundaries and the conditions they need to be in a winning position and then they maintain that. They stick to it and they go all the way to the finish line with it. This is something that we can't associate the three other teams with. The three other teams are quite wild, right? They are quite wild and they are very explosive and they can, through this, explode massive leads and annihilate the enemy team and also at the same time look at sloppy. So the terms we've coined on this channel is level of activity, lowest precision. Down one, when they are winning, very often they are very good at making few decisions that are going to win you the game. But when they are losing, they're also very good at upping the activity. They are very, very good at recognizing their game state. If they are in the losing position, they're not just going to fall over and lose. That's why I think that one is tough to define in terms of playstyle because I feel like they're just very, very well-rounded. I wouldn't say that they're a slow team because they're precise, because in moments where activity is necessary to elevate their position in the game, they are willing to throw that on the table. Especially in the early game, when the game starts and the game is in an even state, they are willing to take the right risks to put themselves in an advantageous position. Damwon, as a unit, the thing that impressed me the most throughout my time in the LCK about them was, as five, they were very good at recognizing what is going to put them in a winning position, and when they have a winning position, maintain it and stick to it and go all the way to the finish line with it. And I think Showmaker really is the epitome of this. He's going to take risk when it's necessary, but he's not going to take risk when it's not necessary. He's not going to be the most volatile player. He understands his position in the game, and he has trust in his teammates to fulfill, you know, the idea of Damwon. At the other hand, you have Caps. Spring-loaded with dynamite. Caps takes a lead, and he's willing to take some risks. Risks that might put the game in a great position, but in some cases also put the game in a worse position. Caps. The reason I put him in uh, my top list for mid, some people left him off of there. The reason I put him out there was, I think, Caps, his vision for the game is better than any other mid laner. While Chovy might be a strong laner, his synergy with jungle, his synergy with the rest of his teammates, and his vision for the game, it's really not there. 
Chovy is not a complete mid laner. If I choose someone that is uh, like the most complete mid laners, my list would be Knight, Rookie, and um, Faker. Complete mid laners. They have good vision for the game, strong laning, and so forth, and good synergy with their teammates and so forth. Obviously, Rookie and 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 Faker are like I'm talking about when they were in 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 their best form. I know there's going to be a discussion in the comments. What Showmaker and Showmaker has as a massive strength, I think, good synergy with Canyon. Great synergy with Canyon. Also, very, very strong lane phase. Very strong lane phase. But if Caps gets an advantage, he does way more than that than most mid laners. The reason I say Knight is a, the most complete one is because I think he has the full package. Great synergy with Jungle. Uh, great lane phase. Very good vision for how he needs to win the game. Uh, very, very complete uh, as a player. And the reason I put... <laughs> you know, it was tough to rate Showmaker. I believe I put him fourth on my list right after Caps. It was tough to rate Showmaker because he, as I mentioned, he does... He, he's not going to do more than necessary. And I wouldn't fault him for that. He's surrounded by great players. And this is something that can be said about everyone on Dama. Damwon is a very, very well-rounded team. I, I believe that's the fourth time I've said it. Let's continue lane to lane. I think Ghost versus Perks, I think they are very similar as players. I think Ghost might have a wider champion pool. Because Perks was very effective on Jin. the question is what comes next. We, we remember the blunders from the group stage. Uh, Ghost has played Draven, a good Kalista, he plays a great Ash. He has a very, very good champion pool and I think is very underrated by others because of the spotlights that Canyon has and Naguri has on this team. Because Ghost, just like Showmaker, is going to do, you know, it's not going to take any risks when he's winning. And I really want to reinforce this idea that when risks are necessary, Tam on do them. I think it's important to note that even though, you know, we have LCK versus LEC, it's completely irrelevant in this context. DRX and Genji have nothing to do with what Damwon is. Same way Mad Lions, Rogue and Fnatic have nothing to do with what G2 is. These two teams are heavy, heavy outliers of their region. I think the LPL teams you can contextualize and you can see a lot of similarities, but Damwon and G2, you know, for me this is Damwon versus G2, this is not LEC versus LCK. That part is completely irrelevant. It's not LEC counter LCK, you know? Is G2 has had a good track record against Korean teams. I think it's very important to make that distinction because these two teams are very different from what the, other, the rest of the region has to offer. Very important. We continue lane by lane. I mentioned Perks. I think Ghost, Perks, very similar as players. I think Ghost has shown a higher level so far, but Perks can ramp up, right? He can ramp up. Which, is, he, he, which I believe he needs to. I think his gen performance was, was wonderful. Needs to continue in the same vein. Mickey and Barrel. So we were talking about, you know, how Showmaker and, and Ghost have a very specific role. Barrel plays with high variance very often. Very high variance. He is Korean Hillisan. Many games, when Damon is winning, you can see him entered a little bit. Uh, he is always looking for game-breaking uh, situations. And um, I think this is good. I think this is good. I think if you want to look at the, the wild stallions of Damwon, then it would be Barrel and Noguri. But Barrel more so. And there's been games where he's been running it down a little bit. But it has never been a big enough issue for it to matter. 
there's been moments where Beryl does things that uh, completely wins the game. Uh, for as long as I have watched Beryl, there's been many cha uh, like opportunities like this. Beryl is very wild in terms of his approach to the game. Like He's willing to pick Sejuani bot just to deny the enemy an AP jungle. He's willing to pick Poppy bot just to counter the enemy composition and completely sack the lane phase against Genji. He's willing to dive with Pantheon, level 1, level 2. He's very, very aggressive. Right? Very aggressive. And I think uh, Mickey has been the pillar of consistency when it comes to support. Most consistent support throughout the whole World Championship. I think maybe Core JJ is in that conversation too, but we have a smaller champions. Uh, I mean, smaller cha uh, sample size. That's what I was trying to say. Sample size. Sample size. Mickey has been very consistent. I feel like Mickey has performed at a consistent 90%, while Beryl has been like from 70 to 100, you know, 70 to 100. Which is a very strange way to put it because Mickey has also had like 100 moments. But both players can be very, very fucking clutch. They can definitely be, uh, you know, the ones who, who decide things. And um, I think in the context of how supports can interact with the game, it's, it's strange because I think, I mentioned top 2v2 I think is in Damon's favor. But I think 3v3 mid, I would, you know, say it's kind of a toss up. I think also Perks has shown moments where he's good at impacting mid, historically. But all in all, when I look at the super role, I think it's rather even. I think Ghost, I would give him slight advantage over Perks. The key thing here, the key champion that Mickey plays that he doesn't get to show yet is Gragas. So I've been talking about Gragas a lot on this channel. Super much. Way too much. It is very good into Pantheon. And this is, of course, Battle's signature pick. And Mickey has shown that he plays Pantheon. So I really feel like Mickey is very prepared coming into this matchup. That I'm almost willing to give him the edge over Barrel. Yeah, I'll give Mickey the edge over Barrel. As a whole now, playstyle-wise, I already mentioned it. You know, I spoke a lot about Damon's playstyle, but G2's playstyle, I think if they get over the hurdle of the early game, they get, they get to play the game that they are very strong at. And that is the mid to late game, Fog of War game. Uh, they are very good at creating suffocating situations where the enemy can make a lot of mistakes. We saw it against Genji. Genji didn't know how to control their side lanes at all. Damwon is not that. You give Damwon, Twisted Fate, Camille, Nidalee, you're going to be in trouble. The same way Genji was in trouble against it, even though they were very far ahead and had three drakes up and just threw the game and gave away Nash. There's um, definitely, you know, G2 still have a strength when it comes to the mid to late game decision making, but we've seen, you know, we've seen bad teams bad teams, worse teams, take games off of better teams by simplifying the game. So you remember FlyQuest against Top Esports, or PSG versus JDG. Um, these teams recognized that they were ahead and simplified the game. They didn't take any risks for additional 6 CS or an additional jungle camp. They just played around the Drake spawn timers, and there was no room for... You know, I don't want to call it bullshit, but I think that's the only way I can really describe it. You know, there's no room for anything out of the norm uh, that can come and really break away the game. Right? And I feel like that one can follow that line of thought and, you know, simplify the game and not put themselves in any position where G2 can 
you know, pull up a rabbit out of a hat. Because this is something that we see G2 do so, so often. As a conclusion, you know, before we reach the conclusion, I guess I should mention the draft. I think draft-wise, you know, I'm curious what's going to happen if Graves gets removed. I think Orn is in the picture, advantage Wonder. Orn out, advantage uh, Nuguri, this I mentioned. I think support pool, better. AD carry pool, better for Ghost. Mickey better support pool. Perks, play the wonderful Jin. What comes next? Play the OK Ezreal, you know. He has, um, you know, a lot of room to to grow. And I think Perks is the right player when it comes to growth. This is a man that ramps up within a week more than I've ever seen any other player do. You know, this man knows how to recognize, oh, this is a mistake. I'm going to fucking fix it. I'm going to sleep on it. And then, boom, it's gone. This is, you know, he's the GOAT of Europe for a reason. You know, of course, Caps is right there competing with him together with Jankos. It, this is the, the, the GOAT uh, Western team, uh, for sure, right? No one comes close in that conversation. Maybe Moscow 5, but I think I think that's gone, right? I think that's that, that ship has sailed. I think G2 has sailed past it really easily. So G2 can definitely grow in this time span and mentally can have an advantage. There's a lot of crisscross, you know, there's crossovers in terms of champion pool. Twisted Fate is going to be super interesting. Will they trade Twisted Fate for Silas? Will Silas be banned to force a Twisted Fate ban? Uh, there is a lot of champions that uh, both of these teams play. So draft is going to be super, super interesting. And can definitely be a deciding factor uh, in such a tight matchup. I still think, you know... Sorry to all the G2 fans, I think that Dam1 is favored coming into this. Out of all of the things that I mentioned, I think the biggest advantage Dam1 have is that they've just played this, this type of game for a very long time. And G2 has been forced to play catch-up a little bit uh, coming into China and after the group stage and so forth. Of course, we judge a lot uh, G2's performance of their games against Suning, but it turns out that Suning is, is an absolute monster. But all in all, I think Dam1 is favored. But I wouldn't be surprised if something goes wrong for Dam1. There is definitely that question mark in the air. The mental advantage, the draft preparation, and G2 showing time and time again that in the span of a week, they can get a lot better. There's also the question of competition, right? People say that Dam1 didn't have a lot of good competition. But I think that's very unfair. I think DRX and Genji, what they showcased at the World Championship was not so similar to the level that they showcased um, regionally. I think um, while it's easy to point to results and talk about the results, I think, you know, the eye test definitely, you know, tells you a different story. I want to put a percentage on it. I think... You know, my, my, my gut feeling t tells me 55, 45, you know, somewhere around the edge to down one. You know, from, from the things that we can grasp and grab a hold on to and discuss, I think uh, definitely down one went out on those categories. But in terms of, um, you know, intangibles, things that we know about G2 but can't really, you know, measure are definitely in the favor of G2. There is a room here for consistency to fall flat. G2 is a very magical team. <laughs> as silly as that sounds, it's the truth. So I wouldn't put it past G2 at all to win this series. But from an analytics standpoint, Dam1, Canyon's form has just been too good. Canyon is playing like a world champion. And uh, jungle just happens to be the most important role. And um, Jankos did well against Clid, but Clid, no offense to Clid, the man ran it down uh, in the best of five. And SOFM, uh, when he played against Jankos, ran laps uh, around him. And um, of course, <laughs> when I point to Jankos, I want to repeat, it's a team effort to jungle. It definitely is. So it's not only on Jankos. 
It's just that uh, Suning and Damwon have played with their jungler as a centerpiece for longer than the other two teams. And that's super, super important. Now, you've heard my prediction. I think Damon, I, I, if, if the series gets dirty, <laughs> G2 is going to win. <laughs> dirty series is perfect for G2. But um, Damon on paper, I think, is better. So my prediction is uh, Damon win. Sc predicting scores, I think, is stupid. But if you really want one, fuck it, just 3 1 Damon. Okay? And that means the series is super close and so forth. But I think there's a lot of variables here at play. Mental, draft, form, a lot of things. Uh, I'm slightly worried about that one having, knowing how much they've built up coming towards this day. But something that I've learned of my time as a coach, in the past I was no emotion, no bullshit. Emotions are inconsistent. But then there is a certain aspect of using emotions and being in charge of your emotions and recognizing in which emotional states you are more effective on in certain things. What I'm saying is there are certain players that play better when they're angry. There are certain players that play better when they're happy. There are certain players that, you know, when they think of something sad that happened to them, they, they perform better. You know, it's, I'm just saying that em emotions are powerful and anything that is powerful can be used for you or against you. Think nuclear power, you think religion. There's many things that are powerful that can be used for good and for bad. The reason I'm mentioning it is, is that build-up can really set up a story of you just really unleashing on the day, right? Or it can build up a story of you really dropping the bomb on the day. And that's what's so cool about G2. I can say with confidence that coming into this best of five, poof, they're coming to play. And that's uh, exciting to think about. Coming into the other series, I mentioned already that I think Suning have... I like coming into like summer... You know, they go 3 0 by Top Esports. And I think Top Esports, I can say from the get-go, I think they have an advantage. But Suning have improved, 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 improved. And I think Suning has played with the jungle as their centerpiece for a very long time. Everyone was very excited about Casa's performance in the best of five against Fnatic, but I was not, honestly. I think um, Carso, Carso to me is LPL Yankos, you know, and that's that's a compliment, you know, that's a good thing. I think he's very, very good at supporting his laners. I think Top Esports is in a lot of ways very similar to, to G2, you know, these, these two teams are very similar. I think there are more similarities between Damon and Suning than there are, like Damon and Suning have similarities and I think Top Esports and G2 have similarities. Top Esports, Carso, supports his laners, and his laners are very, very good. As individual players, they are monsters across the board. And um, I think game number four, Carso, even though he recovered beautifully with Nidalee, at eight, if you only look at the first eight minutes of the game, Selfmade was rocking his world. But then Selfmade is casually doing Rift, or he's like, guys, I'm super far out, I'm doing Rift, we're going to win this game. And then his team just gives him a, nearly a triple kill. And that was like, that, that blew my mind. That blew my mind. Game number one, two, not so exciting games from Carson. So I think that is, that is like the point of entry. And having a point of entry already is a good thing. Because across the board, your players have been playing fucking good. Huang Fang, Sword Art, Bin, Angel... Very, very good performance. It is hard to define it the same way I did with the Damwon and G2 matchup because I felt like the whole series between JDG and Suning was just a mechanic check. There were so many decisions that I disagreed with, but it turned into just a full-on mechanic check. 
and it was so tough to follow the flow of the game because it was just fight after fight after fight and every fight is just a skill check and Suning were winning in those skill checks they had the better draft to do so and they had the better players to do so and coming into this match I, I know it's going to be an absolute bloodbath but I feel like in terms of skill checks Top Esports can roll a lot better than JDG Suning still the story of their summer has been improvement but I think Top Esports is favorite I think this, we're going to have a Top Esports versus Damwon finals. But I wouldn't be surprised if uh, something else happened. In other world championships, it, it got me thinking because this was a very, very tough one to, to really decide on in terms of predictions. Um, past world championships, I felt like it was much easier to make predictions in the semis. Last year, FBX. Um, actually... What, what did I predict between FBX and IG? I might have predicted IG. Hmm. Was it easier? Anyway, that's for another video. <laughs> ah. I hope my ramblings make sense. Uh, forgive me for being all over the place. Uh, you guys, these videos are like an invitation to my mind. And uh, the information is... A bit unfiltered and sometimes I can also understand it might be unclear. And if anything's unclear, please leave a comment below and I'll try to, uh, you know, specify what I mean and discuss what I mean and uh, go into depth about what I mean. But I think either way, as a fan of Good League Legends, I am so, so excited. And the fact that we have... Damwon versus G2 as a best of five and whoever is going to play against Suning on top esports that alone is super super exciting because you have Damwon and G2 heavy outliers of the region these are teams that don't come around often the moment you know I have lost against G2 many many times but the moment this roster disbands I, am, I will be ready to shed a tear you know, because a team like that doesn't come often. And Dam one, I can say the same thing. Anyhow, that's it for this video. I know you guys waited for a long time. I hope it did the way justice. I wish you all the best. Take care. Uh, bless you and bless your face if you sneeze during this video. Uh, what do you think of my new haircut? I feel, I feel fresh. Yeah. Peace.